All right. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Jesse. I'm speaking about real-world adversarial examples. Um, so I'm from MIT. I do work at uh, Josh Tenenbaum's Computational Cognitive Science Lab, but I also work with this independent student research group called Lab6. Um, so our team is currently five people made up of MIT like undergrads and PhD students. It's entirely student-run, so we don't have any like um, formal advisor or um, anything like that. Um, and I'll, I'll be speaking about adversarial examples. Um, so I guess for a brief primer for those of you who aren't familiar, adversarial examples are examples that are designed to fool machine learning classifiers in a certain way. Um, so on the right here, uh, sorry, on the left here, you have a tabby cat. Um, a normal like state-of-the-art image classifier would have no problem identifying this with high confidence as a tabby cat. Um, but given a certain kind of noise applied to the image, we actually find that adversarial examples or these um, images that have barely imperceptible noise to the human can fool machine learning classifiers with high confidence and basically make it classify it as whatever an attacker or adversary wants it to be. Um, so just to talk about kind of the high level goal of this talk, what I'm concerned about or what our group is concerned about is whether adversarial examples are a real problem for practical systems. So adversarial examples were actually first talked about like way back in 2013, but has really started to um, become popular in the research community recently in the last few years. And there's been a lot of talk about like, oh, you know, like we're starting to use machine learning in all these real systems. Um, is this something that we actually need to be concerned about or is it just a kind of theoretical curiosity? And the goal of this talk is to show you that yes, it is a real kind of consideration um, in practical systems, and we are able to make attacks in these kinds of practical settings under very limited constraints or um, threat models, as I'll go over later. So just to go over like um, the work that I'll be going over, we have two papers. Um, both of these were presented as posters at uh, ICML this past summer. Um, the first one is called Synthesizing Robust Adversarial Examples, and that's basically how we generate 3D adversarial objects. Um, the second paper is black box attacks with limited queries and information, and that's talking about how um, when you have these machine learning systems deployed in the real world, like let's say Google's machine learning classifier, uh, uh, image classifier, um, you don't have access to their proprietary models, algorithms, data, um, and there's often kind of limits on the kind of queries you can make or information you have about the system. Are you sta still able to generate these kinds of examples that fool the classifier in these kinds of cases? Um, and then I'll talk a bit about maybe high level, what this means for security, for machine learning, and all sorts of other things. Um, cool, so I kind of talked about what adversarial examples are. Um, so this is the image that I showed before, and all we've done is applied some kind of imperceptible noise um, bounded by some epsilon. So um, you can like set this constraint, but basically, um, it's imperceptible to any human, and um, we can gener generate these reliably. So this is an example in kind of real-time demo. Um, so this is a tabby cat, but after a few iterations of this um, generation procedure, you can see that it starts to be classified as a guacamole with high probability, even though it basically hasn't changed visually. And it's not just like the particular class guacamole, you can make it look like whatever you want. Um, it can be a lionfish, it can be a timber wolf, flamingo, stove, whatever your imagination comes up with. Um, so how does this work? Um, and the idea behind it is actually very simple. So the way we train like a typical deep learning model is you have some image or input that you feed into a model, and then you get out predictions, which come in the form of a distribution over classes. Um, and the way that you train this model is you say, okay, like, how do I optimize the weights of my model so that I maximize the probability of the actual real target class um, given like this image? And when you generate an adversarial example, you apply that kind of same reasoning, except now you're saying, how do I change my image so that I maximize a particular adversarial class? And it's formulated in exactly the same way, so we use gradient descent, we say, take the gradient of the target class, like the adversarial class, with respect to your image, and then just like perturb your image step by step until you get to some adversarial image, um, subject to some constraints on like, oh, we want the image to be visually similar, so we're going to 
um, do this kind of uh, clipping procedure that I'll kind of describe now. Um, so in code, this kind of looks like this. Um, and this is literally all it takes to generate an adversarial example. You go through your iterations and you say, um, I'm going to evaluate like my gradient with respect to my input. I'm gonna like, oh, I don't know why it's flashing, sorry. Um, so I'm gonna update my image and then I'm going to clip it so that um, my adversarial image is within epsilon of the original image. Yep. Right, uh, so that's this step right here. So um, yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so when you do the gradient to st send step, you don't want to like actually make your cat into a guacamole. You want it to be clipped within an epsilon ball around your original cat image. So um, it's a certain kind of pixel distance or L2 distance. Um, so one natural question from here is, um, do these kinds of examples uh, translate over to kind of real world settings? And there was this work done by Karakin et al. in 2016 um, that kind of printed out these images um, onto sheets of paper and then looked at, for example, like, oh, if I um, try to classify this with a phone camera, um, do these images still appear adversarial given like lighting conditions and like um, maybe like camera sensor noise? And the answer that they found was yes. Um, so this was like kind of preliminary work in like translating these kinds of adversarial examples to the real world. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of people were talking about um, in 2015 and 2017, these papers about how um, the first paper said, okay, like adversarial examples exist, but once you like zoom in or do some translation to the image, then they no longer are adversarial. And then the second paper was like, yes, so like in a situation like a self-driving car, where you're driving by this stop sign, it's only adversarial, um, so in that third frame, it's the stop sign is identified as a sports ball, um, but once you drive past it or once you're like slightly at a different angle, then it no longer looks adversarial because it kind of depends on this particular arrangement of pixels in the image in order for the classifier to be fooled. So the conclusion was um, a very kind of confident, no need to worry about adversarial examples in object detection in autonomous vehicles. And as we uh, showed, that is actually not the case. Um, there is a need to worry because you can generate adversarial examples that are robust to um, kind of translations and transformations. Um, but in the typical case, let's say, so this is our original adversarial guacamole cat. Um, you see that once we zoom in just a tiny bit, like barely imperceptible amount, um, the original class immediately becomes um, the top class again. So this was the topic of our first work, synthesizing robust adversarial examples. Um, and the key idea here was instead of optimizing your image just by itself, we're going to optimize it over a distribution of transformations. So recall earlier that we wanted to optimize the probability of like some target class with respect to X. Now we're going to say, oh, we want to um, optimize this image over some transformations that we can model in the world that we expect like, um, let's say our self-driving car or like our image classifier to encounter. And we want this kind of um, adversarial example to um, persist over that distribution. Um, and again, like our distance metric from earlier also translates um, in this translated space. Like we want it to remain within the epsilon ball. Um, so sorry for the font failures, but um, so the idea of this kind of um, algorithm that we presented, which we called expectation over transformations or EOT, was that you have this image, you model some transformation and some parameters of that transformation. So that could be the degree of rotation or like the amount, the range of like scaling or something like that. Um, and these are randomized, so you sample them. And you know the distribution because you can model kind of what you expect to see. Um, and now, again, like I mentioned, um, we're going to optimize that target adversarial class given that we know this transformation is being applied to the image. And to do this backward differentiation, you have to note that the transformation should be differentiable, but this is fine because most of the transformations we're concerned with are simple kinds of things that we can differentiate through easily. So this is like, again, similar to the step that we had earlier, except now it's over distribution. And as we can see here, applying this method, no matter how much we zoom in, it still persists. 
And then also this was kind of, um, that was in simulation and now we wanted to see like, um, kind of in this Karakin et al. All setting, if we print it out on a piece of paper and have all these factors like noise and lighting and like weird rotations and stuff, does it still persist? And again, we saw that the answer is yes. So this is a cat identified as a desktop computer. So then the nat next natural question is, can we translate um, this kind of idea to more kinds of transformations? Can we translate it to, in particular, three-dimensional transformations. So can we make an object that is not only, let's say, adversarial from like, like uh, scaling or rotations you can do in the two-dimensional plane, but also all kinds of like three-dimensional rotations. So as you can imagine in the real world, this would be really interesting because you could produce objects that a self-driving car could pass by and um, consistently be fooled by. Um, so again, this is like much, much of the similar idea, except now, instead of an image, we have a 3D model, and we're modifying the pixels um, that are, uh, the pixels of the texture that are being like kind of pasted onto the model. Um, and there is a bit of kind of like hackiness um, around the rendering, because again, we want the whole kind of process to be differentiable. So um, you can read about this in our paper, but we, had some tricks where um, we modeled the rendering as a kind of sparse matrix multiplication so we could differentiate through it, um, and then um, effectively apply the same process that I just explained for 2D images, except now optimizing over the pixels of a particular texture applied to a 3D model. Yeah. So this is what it looks like in simulation. On the left here, you have the normal turtle that looks like a turtle, a particular kind of uh, species of turtle, a loggerhead. And then on the right, uh, you had the adversarial turtle that was um, classified as adversarial from uh, several angles. And then we actually printed it out. So um, by printed it out, I mean we found a 3D printer manufacturer that could print in color, and kind of like actually um, we modeled kind of the like manufacturing inconsistencies and all those kinds of things. Um, and eventually, after several iterations, we produced we produced this um, 3D adversarial turtle that's identified as a rifle. This is Google's Inception B3 classifier we're concerned with. The class is over there. Um, so this is a turtle. That's just the normal texture applied. And then we have this adversarial turtle that looks like a rifle from all angles. Yep. So that was our first work, and that was kind of like exploring how we could um, translate these ideas from adversarial examples into like real world settings. Um, and then we started to think about, well, that was actually um, in a white box case. And I'll explain what that means in a second. But um, that was assuming that we have some knowledge of the model and we're kind of given like uh, most crucially the ability to differentiate through the model, right? Um, but in most kinds of cases, if we're say like trying to attack a proprietary system deployed by a company, you're not going to have that kind of information, and we're gonna be in this kind of black box setting. Um, so the threat models are different, and I'll explain in a second why threat models are important, but in our second work, we kind of look at um, when we are in this, these kinds of limited settings, what kinds of attacks can we do? Um, so a threat model, as I just mentioned, was um, this kind of, the kind of assumptions we make about our attacker, or the kind of scope of potential threats in an application. Um, so in the white box case, you can assume um, you know, the attacker has access to your model, they can differentiate through it. In the black box case, you might say something like, well, um, I'm going to assume that like, my model is secure and like, the outside world only has access to it through this kind of like API or something. Um, and uh, given this kind of threat model, what kinds of attacks, what is the worst thing that an attacker could do in this kind of setting? So why are threat models important? Well, you can't develop a secure system without considering what you need to secure against. And I think this is kind of like an idea that seems intuitive, right? Um, but I think a lot of people maybe um, 
approaching security might think like, oh, okay, like to build a secure system, I need to secure against like all kinds of possible threats. But in reality, at some point you have to say, okay, these are the class of threats that we're not going to address, right? Like we're not going to assume that like our employee is like, uh, our, uh, our employees are going to like give away our data and like all these things. We're going to say, assuming we can trust our employees um, and assuming like these kinds of things about like what people have access to in our system, these are the kinds of threats that we're concerned with and the threats that we're going to focus on securing. So very clearly laying out those assumptions is kind of important in these situations and figuring out, especially in um, machine learning security, figuring out what kinds of um, threats and assumptions that you need to make. So when we kind of think about the threat model, we're asking what are the bad things that an attacker could do? So to go through a kind of example of this, um, let's say we had a um, face recognition classifier, uh, face recognition model in a CCTV camera, and it's trained on a bunch of images of people. <clears throat> and given those images, it's learned to recognize like, oh, I've seen this uh, picture of a person in my uh, like database of faces, and if I see them on my camera, I can say, oh, that's Jesse. So one kind of attack that you can do in the system is if you were in a threat model where you say that um, the servers that are storing our data are not necessarily secure, then like maybe like someone could um, hack into the server and like delete my face from the data set and retrain the model, and um, that is a valid kind of attack, right? Um, but in many cases, that's not the kind of attack that we're concerned with because we don't care about kind of this like very far out case where like the attacker can get like access to many different things and um, like train the model, retrain the model, and uh, do all of these kinds of uh, kind of uh, free, like freely allowed attacks. Um, in particular, let's say like, oh, we say we're in a threat model where we can secure the server. Then what kinds of threats are we concerned with? Um, and then in that kind of case, we can say, well, given this threat model where the attacker only has um, control over the inputs to the system, this, the class of attacks that are possible are this and that, and um, here is like the kind of um, defense that we have to make in response to that. So kind of the point I'm trying to make is that adversarial examples are important because they expand the set of threat models that we need to be concerned with. Um, an attacker doesn't need much access at all. Like they don't need access to like the data, the algorithms, the model, the, the kind of server that the data is stored on. All they need to do is modify the input. And given that kind of threat model, it's very hard to think of like, oh, okay, like in normal security, we have all these practices to like uh, defend our servers. Um, but what do we do when we can't restrict people's access to like inputs to the classifier, right? Um, so in these kinds of cases, we need to start thinking about like um, defenses from the machine learning theory perspective. Um, and I'll kind of talk about at the end uh, work that's being done in that vein. Um, but this is kind of the concern with adversarial examples that we don't really need much access at all in order to do very bad things to a system. So as I talked about earlier, um, coming off of our previous work, we asked what happens when um, attackers don't have complete access to the target system. So in the previous work that was white box, and in many of these kinds of adversarial examples work, um, they consider this white box case where you can differentiate through the model and get that gradient very easily. Um, but what happens when it's black box? So um, when we don't have access to the gradients, there's kind of many different ideas we can exploit. And one idea in particular from Paper Knot in 2016 was, what if we, um, let's say, like had a different model that we had control over that kind of mimicked the model that we're trying to attack? So we could, you know, like feed some inputs through this black box model that we don't have control over, um, figure out kind of like its decision boundaries, um, and then retrain our own model and um, use that to determine the gradients. And it turns out that because adversarial examples have these kind of interesting properties that it transfers between uh, different models, like an adversarial example for one model, uh, one image classification model will often transfer to another image classification model. We can exploit these, um, this transferability to generate black box adversarial examples. <clears throat> 
The problem is that um, in practice, this is often hard to train, and um, like especially for targeted attacks where you're trying to elicit a particular adversarial class, um, you can find that the results are often inconsistent or it doesn't transfer 100% of the time. So another method is what if we could estimate the gradient? Um, so from recalling your days of high school calculus, you can kind of approximate a gradient by taking finite differences. So around a point, you could take the uh, derivative at that point or you could take like um, that point plus a little bit, minus a little bit, and find the slope between those two points, and that's just the basic idea behind gradient estimation. Um, the problem is, in previous work, like, uh, like uh, this paper called Zoo, um, they have to run finite differences on every single pixel to figure out, okay, how should I modify this pixel um, to like move down the gradient? How should I model this, uh, modify the second pixel, and so on? For like an image that's like 299 by 299, that's like lots and lots of queries. And in these cases, like in the real world, where we're talking about um, like APIs that have like these rate limits, and you can only like perform a certain number of queries per minute or like per dollar, um, we want to think about how to circumvent these time and money limitations. So what we um, came up with was this uh, application of evolutionary strategies. Um, which are more efficient gradient estimates, uh, essentially. Um, so the idea is instead of using the full gradient, use the ex expectation of the gradient over a search distribution. There's a nice kind of blog post about this, so I won't go over much detail, but basically um, you sample a bunch of points and then use that search distribution to calculate a better gradient. And this is the blog post that I will refer to um, to get some intuition for how that works. But basically, we're able to get better gradient estimates in fewer queries. So this was kind of the distribution. Um, you can look at the results in our paper and comparisons to other papers um, in the details as well. So with regards to this question of white box versus black box, the attacker does not need access to the internals of the model to do an adversarial attack. Then the next question we asked was, what if the attacker doesn't have access to all the predictions of the network? Um, so in the case of like the Google Cloud Vision API, they might only give you like the top K classes. How is this different from the traditional setting? Well, now we can't do something like say, I want to make this rifle look like a cat because we don't have the probability of the cat in the top X classes, so we don't know how to optimize for that. We don't know how to um, take the gradient with respect to that class. So if we wanted to perform targeted classes, this is kind of problematic. So the idea that we had here was, what if instead of you know, optimizing directly for that target class, you start with an image of your target class so that, you know, like let's say I wanted my, um, my rifle to look like a cat, I start with an image of a cat and then maintain that cat class in the top K probabilities while gradually making the cat look more like a rifle or whatever image I actually want to make adversarial. Um, so let's say in this example, we want the target class to be car, so we start with a picture of a car um, and then we take a step towards the original, so this just looks like clipping it to a smaller and smaller epsilon ball around the image that you actually want to be adversarial and then you take the normal adversarial step where you try to make, like, maintain the car in the top K classes. And you keep repeating this kind of iterated process and then stop when the image is within some epsilon of the image that you actually want to make adversarial. So again, like we had this image of a cat that we wanted to make adversarial, so we started with the car, we kept the car in the top K classes, and we gradually make the car look more like a cat. So what this looks like is you start with a dog, you keep the dog in the top X classes, and you gradually make it look more like a skier while trying to keep that German Shepherd in the top five classes. So we did this on Google Cloud Vision and found that indeed you can get this picture of a skier to look like a dog. So what if you had even le less information, right? What if you didn't even have access to those probabilities, you just had access to the labels? Now this is like, kind of like covers maybe the majority of machine learning applications nowadays where you get like, um, like maybe on Google Photos, like a list of tags for your photo. Um, they assume that you're not like the average machine learning researcher, you don't really care about the probability that your um, face is like 90%. Um, can we do an attack in this kind of setting? 
Now again, the problem is that we need something to optimize for, right? Um, and now that we don't have the probabilities, what can we do? Well, the idea is, what if we could use some kind of proxy for that probability? In particular, what if we could use noise robustness? So um, if we want our image to be very, like, quote unquote, strongly adversarial, that image should be adversarial even when we add a little bit of noise to it. So say this image of a cat, um, we add a little bit of noise, um, so in like multiple kind of deltas, um, and then we look at the ranking of our desired adversarial class, the guacamole. We figure out this kind of like proxy score. Um, so in this case, um, R of X is the number of classes minus the rank of the target class. So the higher it is, the better, right? Because we want guacamole to be in the top class. And we do this for each of the images that we've perturbed with some noise. And then we use that to calculate this kind of like proxy score, which is like a measure of how adversarial the image is. So um, this is like the kind of precise formulation. Um, so for the score x, zero means that um, all the images in the like vicinity of this adversarial image are classified correctly. So you get, it's like a bad adversarial image. Um, and S, S of x equals one means everything around the vicinity is adversarial. So it's a quote unquote good adversarial image. So the nice thing about this score is that it's continuous even when we only have one label. You don't need probabilities to calculate that ranking of the labels. And S of x can take on many values, making our original method of using finite differences meaningful and applicable. So in practice, we do this with a Monte Carlo approximation, which is just the process I showed before where you take many samples um, of your image plus some noise. So we showed that in both the partial information and the label only case, which are increasingly realistic kind of threat models, um, the attacker does not need access to all the outputs of the system to do this kind of adversarial attack. And these are our kind of results um, quantitatively, which you can refer to our paper for more details if you're interested in that. Um, but the conclusion here is that adversarial examples can be practically and efficiently constructed in these kinds of real world settings. So what we need to consider from here is ML systems that are built with security in mind. So right now, a lot of researchers in this area are working on both attacks and defenses. Um, and there is no kind of um, working defense for adversarial examples. So the solution is not available or easy or simple. Um, it's kind of a very cat and mouse game in the field where like researchers come up with defenses all the time, then find out like, um, like it's broken within like the week. Um, and a lot of the problem is maybe not thinking clearly about these kinds of threat models and what kinds of assumptions you can make when attacking these systems. Um, so what we need in both research and industry is this kind of more security focused mindset, which um, is gradually permeating into the machine learning community. Um, but thinking more in terms of like evaluating how robust these kinds of systems that we're depending on for day to day decisions are and working gradually towards the theoretical understanding of deep learning that we need to actually make these models robust to adversarial examples. So again, like people are working on this all the time and companies are concerned about this as well. Um, and awareness is kind of the key here. So people can continue working on these kinds of things. Um, so that's our talk. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email. Um, we also have code available on GitHub for both of these papers if you wanna replicate our results. Um, and thank you. Um, thought about using like this whole episode framework for training, that like increase robustness. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, uh, that's definitely one approach to making defenses. So once you generate your adversarial examples, what if you add those back to your training set? Um, it does work to some extent. It doesn't work perfectly, um, but it's definitely like an active research area. Thank you.